All right. Let me call this meeting to order. Can we take roll call, please? Councilmember Camus? Here. Councilmember Foley? Here. Councilmember Dieppe? Councilmember Perales? Here. Councilmember Esparza? Okay, we have a quorum. All right, we have nothing on the consent calendar, so we'll go straight into the reports to the committee for verbal economic development activities. Excellent, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth Handler because she pulls these together and has done a great job presenting them, so take it away, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Handler, Public Information Manager, Office of Economic Development. The February newsletter, which I cannot believe, um, includes um, a, a, a really great program that our International Programs Manager, Joe Hedges, kicked off last week, which um, saw some 40 folks, international entrepreneurs, visiting San Jose after having been to the Consumer Electronics Show in um, Las Vegas. And they came to town under the auspices of the Select USA program of the Department of Commerce to spend two days in the Bay Area, one day in what the, another city further north. Um, but the second day was in San Jose. And they heard um, an amazing selection of presentations on everything from real estate opportunities to how to work with venture capitalists. And then they toured the Jabel Blue Sky Labs, and then we were able to spend some time at Common Grounds, one of our new uh, co-working places. And there will be a video of the whole event available that will be linked to our newsletter story as well. Um, in North San Jose, again, the international theme persists. We are happy to welcome the Cube Center, which is a project of the Hangzhou Regional Government in China and um, offers life sciences, startup, and accelerator services. And the, the wet labs portion of that facility um, is being managed by our own BioCube, so we're really pleased about that. So that's another addition to North San Jose. We are putting out another one of our development reports, which um, indicates a lot of additions, even excluding the, the Google project. We're seeing um, new additions for plans for 577 residential units, almost 2 million square feet of office space, and 247,000 square feet of commercial space to the roster of projects in the pipeline. And we have a full report on that in our blog post. Um, we had a presentation, um, two, two people from San Jose's city OED department were part of a um, business journal event on the future of downtown. This is their second annual um, event and there were almost 500 people in attendance. It was very well attended. Um, <clears throat> there were protesters but the whole situation was ably managed by the editor of the business journal. Kim was one of the panelists on the future of downtown, speaking with Mary Papazian and Alexa Arena from Google. And then our own blog, Aza Lalich, was on um, a real estate panel. So it was a really good event. And there will be a full video linked to that blog post, too. Um, finally, we're um, spreading the word for our, our comrades in ESD on the Better Buildings Challenge letting our um, buildings owners know that this is an opportunity to participate in a very forward-looking uh, uh, green program to help bring their, uh, their buildings up to the best possible um, level of low carbon footprint. And then there's going to be another story which just broke today, and I didn't have time to add it, which is um, an announcement of a uh, very interesting workshop that the Department of Commerce is putting on um, to help people prevent the proliferation of fakes and um, intellectual pro um, property infringement. And that's going to be coming up in February. That's it. All right. Any questions from our panel here. I, I think we, I, we had the rest of the council show up after roll call, so went to, uh, we do have a comment from the public. Um, Aaron, strategy, well, sorry, uh, Mason Fong, 
Sorry about that. For the next item. Next for the next item. item. Okay. All right. Thank you for the report. On to uh, business development and small business update. Sorry, I said agenda item number one, and I think we got confused. We'll get you on the next item. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. Chris Burton with the Office of Economic Development. I'm joined by Nathan Donato Weinstein and Des Woodworth. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a very sort of brief intro um, and then <coughs> hand it over to these two to walk you through our annual update on our business development activities, uh, both our citywide business outreach program and our small business program, which functions through Work to Future. Um, we actually have with us today, I think our entire business development team is in the audience. So hopefully there's no business emergencies in the city <laughs> for the next hour. Um, if there is, we can always run out. Um, so, so we have you know, a growing team, which is good, but our work plan has expanded as well to encompass a lot more sort of diverse work uh, with the addition of Jared Ferguson as our housing catalyst and Emily Lapome has joined our team as our development facilitator, as well as our traditional business development folks um, and our place-based folks, uh, including Blog A on downtown and Sal Alvarez, who covers some of our neighborhood business district work. Um, so we cover a lot of ground. Uh, we, we think we're making a significant impact on the city, um, and we're happy to be here to talk to you about it. All right, thank you, Chris, um, and thank you to the committee. So this is my favorite presentation of the year, I think, because it's where we get to talk about all of the kind of fun stuff that's been keeping us busy, um, and kind of some of our takeaways throughout the year, as well as what's on the horizon. Um, and so to kind of kick us off, um, I'm here with Des Woodworth, and we're going to do a little bit of a tag team here. Um, most of our comments are going to focus around kind of the fiscal year 18, 19, but we also are going to highlight some more recent activities as well. Um, most of my comments will be around kind of our medium and large size business community, while Des will focus on our small business ecosystem. Um, and what a business ecosystem it is. You know, there's about 53,000 businesses in San Jose who are collectively responsible for roughly 440,000 jobs. And in addition to providing employment for residents, you know, our businesses also contribute to our, our city's physical, um, social, and even cultural health. And one of the OED business development team's core roles is um, business outreach. And business outreach meetings are a key way that we kind of take the temperature of our business community, sort of the vital signs. Um, and these uh, touches with business can focus on a, a business recruitment, retention, expansion, or simply staying in touch with kind of what's going on out there. Um, and the numbers on this screen, uh, again, represent mostly medium and large businesses in sort of a, a formal discussions type of context. We touch a lot more businesses day to day. Um, and this year, what we saw was a lot of interest in San Jose from businesses across the spectrum, um, whether uh, kind of they're interested in, in moving or just exploring kind of the waters, especially as some of our other neighboring cities sort of fill up. You know, I think a lot more companies are, are starting to look at San Jose. A lot more investors are starting to look at San Jose. Um, and uh, another big focus this year was permit assistance. Um, as folks looked to navigate our very busy development services partners. Um, and that's one of our key roles as well. The logos on this screen showcase some kind of exciting highlights. Um, these are all briefly described in the memo. Um, and these represent companies that we worked with extensively um, that either moved in, expanded, or leased additional space in San Jose, mostly during 1819. Um, of these, you know, Bloom Energy, which is located um, in North San Jose, represents a really interesting way these things sometimes go. So city staff started talking with Bloom years and years ago. They were based in Sunnyvale. They make this really interesting um, kind of energy device um, that's gained a lot of popularity um, and kind of began discussions about the technology, about potentially moving to San Jose, um, and held numerous meetings with the company. Um, the mayor's office has played, played a role over the years as well. And these things take time, and thankfully, it 
uh, ended up bearing fruit. And in um, early 2019, Bloom moved uh, 600 employees into their new building um, in 237 at first. Um, OED also worked to kind of help seal the deal with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, um, which also moved in this year. Um, also to North San Jose. But what I think is really cool when I look at these logos is just the diversity that they represent. So you have sort of, you know, high tech, big name, sort of traditional Silicon Valley. Um, you also have, you know, smaller players, but that are also really critical to our residents, whether it's a grocery store. Um, and then, you know, some of these really interesting new players that are finding San Jose, like Roku, that's moving over from Los Gatos. And now, Des, what have you got for us on small biz? All right. Well, so in addition to the uh, medium and small business, <coughs> sorry, medium and large business support that Nathan was mentioning, uh, the city also works strongly to support small businesses. Uh, with over 50,000 small businesses in San Jose uh, and a wide range of industries, our, st our strategy is somewhat different on the small business side. Um, other factors which influence the strategy are that many small businesses are not uh, terribly sophisticated. They don't have the staffing to maintain uh, people who have expertise in a particular area outside of their own disciplines, uh, which are directly related to their small business. Uh, in addition, 60% uh, of small businesses are minority owned, and uh, more than half of uh, San Jose small businesses are immigrant owned, with 30% of those self-reporting that they have limited English skills. And that all goes into playing a role in, in our uh, strategy and how we go about that. Uh, a big portion of our strategy is the collaborative that we have developed uh, with businessownerspace.com. That's a city-led collaborative. Uh, can which can brings you get the mic closer to oh, your Yes, I'm sorry. Self, thank you. Yes, I certainly can. Uh, does that help? A little yeah. bit. Okay, good enough. <laughs> So uh, there are about 30 small business assistance organizations that participate in the collaborative, uh, which offer free and low-cost services. Together, the city and its partners provide 14,000 uh, small business-related uh, assistance transactions annually. Uh, the city also provides direct assistance when it has specialized knowledge or skills. For instance, the Small Business Ally, which is a program which is targeted at helping small businesses through the permitting process. Uh, also, city procurement, uh, which is actually going to be coming up uh, later in this session. They'll talk to you about the services that are provided directly by the city. Uh, also, uh, we provide uh, targeted uh, populations who have specialized needs that warrant additional attention uh, with additional direct services. For instance, Vegilution, uh, shown in this photo, is working with the city to support low-income cart-based food, uh, cart food vendors. Uh, in addition, immigrants, uh, particularly those with language barriers, as I mentioned, also benefit from additional help. By necessity, the city's small business strategy also emphasizes technology. So we have a website that provides 24-7 support in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, uh, as well as a toll-free line that people can call into for interpretation. We use events, uh, which include a large-scale event that we do annually, as well as smaller-scale events and workshops and partner events, which allow us to contact more small businesses at a time instead of trying to do individual transactions, which with 50,000 is a, it would be a very uh, large lift, so to speak. Uh, the strategy also incorporates listening so that like the work that Nathan was describing earlier where we're meeting with the medium and large scale businesses, we are also trying to listen very hard to what the small businesses are facing uh, so that we can uh, make adjustments to city programs and policies. Uh, the, the approaches include focus groups, partners, uh, collaboration with partners, formal studies, and other methods to, to uh, be able to listen to them. And we'll get to those uh, lessons in a few minutes. Um, we also wanted to talk with you about the policy initiatives that result from that. Uh, since we are doing quite a bit of time on that, not, not just on the outreach, we're doing a lot of work in terms of the policy development. Uh, one of the first of these is the small business anti-displacement work that we're uh, engaged in. Uh, which is uh, in response to the rising costs and development that are happening within some areas. This is an important issue in part in that many small businesses, if they were unexpectedly uh, forced to move, would fail and never recover. Uh, in that case, we would both lose the neighborhood and cultural icons that they represent, but we would also have the loss of jobs that are in 
uh, disadvantaged communities, as well as the loss of income and wealth within these largely family-owned businesses. Uh, with that in mind, we've uh, put together a pilot in Alum Rock, which is one of the areas that we're anticipating going to be impacted by commercial development, I'm sorry, commercial displacement pressures over the next few years. Uh, we've partnered with uh, trusted neighborhood partners, including Alum Rock, Santa Clara Street Business Association, Vegilution, and Somos Mayfair, who uh, and are able to leverage their cultural and linguistic capabilities. Using this has made it uh, possible for us to effectively connect with small businesses to provide them with displacement uh, assistance. Uh, in conjunction with our longstanding businessownerspace.com partners who have agreed to provide rapid deployment activities in the event of an urgent need. The city has also uh, recruited additional organizations which hadn't been present locally in the past, such as Start Small, Think Big, which provides legal assistance uh, to low-income uh, businesses and is working to develop new partnerships such as that with, with uh, a nationwide community development corporation called LISC. These partnerships help address the specialized needs and associated uh, needs associated with displacement. Okay, thank you, Des. So, um, you know, throughout all of this business outreach and policy work, um, we uh, have a few takeaways from kind of the last 18 months. And what I wanted to do in the next couple of minutes is just go over a few of those in brief. Um, this is sort of like the trends section. Um, and uh, one of the things um, we all know uh, it, right now is that labor is really, really tight. So that's kind of one of the big themes out there is just kind of finding um, available workers. Um, and that's one reason why we're really supportive to increase um, pathways uh, to quality jobs through efforts like the Evergreen Valley College um, Tesla training program, um, which is pictured. Um, but there's a couple other trends I wanted to highlight. One is, um, you know, recently there's been a lot of kind of high profile media, media coverage around kind of Bay Area exodus, companies moving elsewhere. Um, you've probably heard like Charles Schwab moving its headquarters out of San Francisco, McKesson doing the same thing. Um, and it's something we're definitely following. So um, in San Jose, we have not yet had a major headquarters move as part of this trend, but our conversations with executives does show that um, many companies you know, are choosing to expand elsewhere, even as they maintain a sizable or stable presence in San Jose. And that's kind of in response to you know, issues around cost of living, housing, available workforce that we're also familiar with. So really important that we all kind of keep an eye on this and think about ways we can continue to support our businesses staying and, and growing in San Jose. Um, another interesting takeaway is, um, you know, a real kind of traditional piece of our economy, which is the hardware sector, um, that you know people at various times have sort of written off for dead in the valley, is very much still king in, um, in San Jose and continues to show signs of life and, and growth. And so um, we've seen consistent um, new arrivals and expansions over the past 18 months of companies that design or make things. These companies might not make those things in San Jose, but they, they design them in San Jose and may make them elsewhere. But these are companies like Lightpoint, Arm, Click Diagnostics, um, Honda R&D, Lightning Motorcycles, One Wheel, Electric Skateboards, Lumentum, and Bloom Energy, um, who make everything from medical devices to chips to power plants and, and motorcycles. Um, and this, is, we think, is a good thing for San Jose. These are companies engaged in bits and bytes, and not just bytes. Um, like you tend to kind of see further up the peninsula where you have more of sort of a social media concentration. Um, we think just in terms of the diversity of our economy, um, this plays to our strength, and we want to continue to support them. Um, some other trends that I think are really interesting to follow is the past year we saw a, a growing trend of businesses that don't sort of easily fit into a traditional box in terms of their use. And this is mostly something you see in, in the retail sector or storefront businesses. Um, and kind of some examples are, you know, this blending of different uses. So you might have um, something that kind of looks and feels a little bit like a, a, a aesthetic salon that also does sort of medicalized procedures, right? Where you might even have a physician's assistant on staff. and um, 
uh, you know, what happens is the city has to look at those and figure out, you know, how do we classify these? How do they fit into our zoning code, our parking regulations? In most cases, you know, our zoning code can handle this kind of stuff, but it's something to keep an eye on. And it's another example of how our, our business ecosystem and particularly our retail ecosystem is evolving and changing. Um, and then finally, you know, companies right now are really struggling um, when it comes to getting into their space. You know, everyone is really busy right now on the private side in terms of contractors and subcontractors and on the city side. And um, in OED, we've been spending a lot of time helping companies and their contractors understand the best paths forward for them to meet their goals around occupancy. And we're engaged as a point of contact and liaison between our industry customers and um, city departments. So in addition to listening to the community, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, in part based on the, what we're hearing from uh, various organizations and, and businesses large and small, uh, we have a variety of targeted support programs uh, which are intended to support those particular areas. For instance, we have a storefronts grant program that provides uh, grants between ten to fifteen dollars, or sorry, ten to fifteen thousand uh, dollars, for small businesses improving the first four uses. Uh, last year, the program uh, provided grants for sixteen businesses, including Hapa, Musubi, Red Dot Fitness, San Jose Museum of Textiles and Quilts, Elements Restaurant, and Park Station Hashery. Uh, in addition, we also have other programs, including the uh, Small Business Allies, uh, SWAN and WAN, who are uh, the f in the picture here, uh, help businesses, small businesses in particular, with the permitting op opening process uh, using a free model, a concierge model, so that they're providing soup to nuts assistance to small businesses in conjunction with their professional uh, staff who are being hired directly by the small business. But, really focused on providing them with the help that they need to get past the, the hurdles that are involved with our uh, permitting process. Uh, we also continue to work with our manufacturing uh, industry. Uh, in 2018, we launched a nonprofit, MFG SJ, which is dedicated to working with our manufacturing community on workforce growth and outreach issues. In 2020, OED expects to take a larger role in working in this area to make sure that the manufacturing companies that we have here, particularly the larger ones, continue to have a role here in, uh, and a home in Silicon Valley. Uh, MFGSJ is hosting its first ever state of manufacturing breakfast, so if you're available on February 6th in downtown, we encourage you to come to that. Awesome, yeah. So. Um, you know, San Jose is a global city, and in 2018-19, um, our program, international programs manager, that's Joe, um, held meetings with, sort of formal meetings, with nearly 40 uh, business or governmental delegations from across the globe. And these are really interesting to sit in on, which I've had the pleasure to do. Um, they focus on kind of, a lot of times, educating um, international officials um, around, you know, our region, our economy, even just stuff like our business culture and like how business is conducted in the United States, which is very different from um, other parts of the world sometimes. Um, and Joe's had meetings recently from um, Yongin, South Korea, Zhejiang, China, Hangzhou, China, and the Vietnam US Association just in like the last month or two. Um, he also administers um, the foreign trade zone for San Jose, which keeps local businesses uh, particularly manufacturers that are bringing in and exporting a lot of stuff, competitive. Um, in the last 18 months, um, the city has seen an uptick in interest in this federal program due to uncertainties around U.S. Um, trade relations with other countries, as you can imagine. Um, so, you know, one of the coolest parts of our job is this piece of it, proactively telling our city's story to various stakeholders, um, whether it's through the news media or at events, forums, or even advertising. And, um, you know, speaking about the city is a huge privilege and responsibility, and we actually really pride ourselves in participating in requests, whether it's a big business audience or even just a small neighborhood association. Um, and this year, there was a burst of speaking requests on topics related to downtown, I think, really spurred by a lot of press coverage and sort of per the perception of momentum. Um, but we also regularly produce our own workshops and events. Our biggest one this year um, was a workshop we hosted in February 
on the federal opportunity, opportunity zone um, incentive that drew more than 100 attendees from philanthropy and the investment world. Um, we also assisted with several high profile groundbreakings, often in partnership with folks like the SVO um, and ribbon cuttings. Um, that's the Verizon project on the top right. Um, and that's kind of the dessert, I think, of our, of our job. Um, and then on the media front, you, you guys you all get a taste of this every month, right? Um, uh, Elizabeth has produced more than 60 blog posts contributing to the 12 editions of the SJ Economy newsletter. And did you know that that newsletter goes out to 5,000 um, subscribers a month? Um, like real subscribers too, not just random, random folks um, that give us bounce backs. People are actually trying to like get into our newsletter now. Um, which is really, really neat to see. Um, and that's in addition to assisting local, national, or even international news media um, with inquiries related to San Jose. I mean, San Jose is um, kind of all over the place, and people need to need help um, accessing uh, department leaders or just city facts and information. Um, so also, I wanted to highlight that in 1819, uh, we launched the San Jose branded merch program, uh, which allows the public to buy shirts, hoodies, travel mugs, ball caps, with the new um, economic development brand mark. Um, Team San Jose is our partner um, on this, and you can actually head over to sanjose.org or the UPS store at the convention center for any of your gift shopping needs. Mm -hmm. And so we want to leave you with just a couple kind of quick hits on things um, we're working on and following um, for kind of this year. Des, what's happening um, with these first two items? Why, thank you, Nathan. Uh, on the small business front, we're uh, working already on the ninth summit on entrepreneurship and innovation, which is a large scale small business event uh, that will be taking uh, place at the beginning of May. Uh, and we're also collaborating, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, on the small business anti displacement uh, focus. Uh, with Alum Rock Santa Clara Street Business Association. Uh, we're holding a series of workshops with them, including negotiating with leases, which we did in conjunction with Start, uh, Start Small, Think Big, and Alum Rock. All of these are with Alum Rock. Uh, access to capital with the Opportunity Fund, uh, which will actually be taking place tomorrow night if you're available, uh, and utilizing a commercial broker with the Minority Business Development Agency, and finally, financial and tax documentation, which we'll be holding in March. So uh, we're trying to hold a series of, of activities to, uh, to foster the small business side. All right, so um, in spring of um, last year, council approved uh, kind of a slate of retail strategies for the city. And thanks to the council, we're uh, prepared to soon hire a retail officer to assist us in implementing those more effectively. Um, you know, retail's changing, and we're fortunate to still have a really strong retail market, but it's important that we keep this sector strong in San Jose. Um, and thriving. Um, I also wanted to highlight sort of uh, kind of what's on the horizon in terms of projects. Um, you know, uh, in the last year, the office brought into the, our business unit our first development facilitation officer, Emily Lapoma, and she's working to streamline and project manage our largest um, projects that will meaningfully impact the city's economy and residents. These include projects like the Adobe Tower and um, the Coleman Highline project. But also, um, I just wanted to highlight that picture is actually on Friday. I got to kind of get inside the mall expansion, um, and it's incredible. Uh, and they have plans to start opening the first of over 100 new stores starting in March, which is really exciting. It's also a huge lift behind the scenes and is kind of going to be one of these all hands on decks uh, moment for us um, as we prepare to welcome um, kind of this new retail food and entertainment offering. And so kind of stay tuned. Um, and then finally, um, we're all really thinking critically about the future of our industrial lands um, in San Jose. And this will be a focus as we look for opportunities to kind of intensify some of these areas, uh, particularly when they're near transit nodes, um, in order to fit more jobs into these areas while also preserving the viability of industrial um, buildings and uses. So, um, you know, manufacturing, wholesale trade, construction are major employers in San Jose, and we want to make sure they continue to have a home here, um, even as we try to make more efficient use of our job generating land. And so that's just kind of a taste um, of the past, present, and future, and we're happy to chat about it. Thank you very much for the presentation. Before we go to the questions from my colleagues, I'm going to call up Mason Fong. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, thank you for hosting this. Uh, the city does great work, and we're really happy to partner uh, with the Office of Economic Development. They have a great staff that always gives presentations to the Silicon Valley organization, which has 1,200 members, half of which are actually small businesses. Um, last year, the SVO, upon request by our members, created a small business issues committee that meets once a month, and we've had lots of presentations from staff. Uh, and looking at this item, which I don't know if it was combined with item one and two, uh, but assuming it was, was that it would be great for one, this presentation to be posted uh, in advance of this meeting, um, but two, uh, as a member of the public, I was trying to research the economic development strategy for San Jose and found the 2010 document, which was 63 pages. Uh, and since then, it seems, at least I could be wrong, but that the uh, staff has not formally updated that packet but rather done a PowerPoint presentation such as today, which is great. But for the members of the public, it'd be great to have a formal outreach process for an update to that strategy where the Silicon Valley Organization's Small Business Issues Committee could uh, weigh in, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, Vice Mayor Chappie Jones' Small Business Advisory Task Force, which the SVO also sits on, um, just to have a, a formal outreach process similar to the four-year general plan. Um, and so on that note, uh, thank you to city staff. They do great work, not to give you more homework, but it's just so that uh, we have a better way to disseminate information to our <laughs> members so that they can weigh in and say, that's the right direction, great job, or that's great, and we would love to, for you to look at this also. So thank you. Thank you. All right, and no more questions from the public, but I have several, and I, my colleagues have several as well, but let me start with mine. Um, the Bloom Manufacturing, uh, the Blue, the Bloom Energy uh, presentation, part of your presentation, are they going to be manufacturing? Is it just a office space? Or? So, the, uh, kind of the future of their, I'll just put it this way. I think Bloom is evaluating the future of their manufacturing operations in the Valley. So they do have some manufacturing operations that remain in Sunnyvale. Um, my understanding is they have kind of a longer timeline to figure out what to do with that than they did with the office component, which is what they moved initially. We would love to have Bloom's manufacturing um, piece in San Jose. So, Absolutely. so when if, if, so, are they going to? So, basically, are they moving their headquarters to San Jose? Correct. Yes. So, so they does move that their mean we get their tax base every time they sell one of these boxes? Yeah. So. Um, do you want to handle the tax question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great question. That is a good question, Councilmember. Yeah, um, obviously, there's some uh, limits to information we can give about the specifics of tax revenues from individual companies. Um, and given that Bloom is a relatively new uh, entrant into the city, we're still waiting to see. So there's a number of different ways that corporations can allocate their taxes between locations. And so um, we'll get a better sense of that sort of once we've seen more reporting. You know, and I, I actually. I've talked That's to true. some people who are talking to them. Um, you know, everybody's in a rush to go to North San Jose. Anybody thinking about th there's a lot of space in South San Jose? No. D9, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, there's I, another I noticed item that, in your report. Yeah. Yeah, so we're super jazzed about um, companies like Infinera, which is moving from Sunnyvale to South San Jose okay. um, in kind of a major way, about 90,000 square feet. Good. Um, and so, you know, Amazon looking at coming into the Monterey Corridor is a big deal good. for us. Good, good, good. So we love all of our business districts in San Jose. And there are different strokes for different folks, right? Yes, 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 yes. And so... Uh, you know, I, I think I think I made a request last time we were talking about branded materials, okay. and I did say tie clips. <laughs> no, no, I don't know if you remember. Do, are, should I go and see if they actually have tie clips? I there? don't think they, uh, we have not addressed tie clips yet. But as a fan <laughs> right. of the tie clip, that's something we'll look okay. at. Okay, you know, so so when we're when we were talking about you know companies that are not expanding in San Jose, and I I, I actually my sister. Uh, works for a very large company, and, and, and she also is not expanding into right. San Jose. One of the things that she was telling me about is that uh, they think that California is heading the wrong direction on taxation. Is that, a, is that, a, uh, is that, a, is that a, also a concern of, of the companies that you were talking to? I think the financial picture is complicated for like all of our companies, and it's different for everyone. Certainly tax, taxes and kind of cost of doing business factors in a big way for lots of companies. As it relates to the competitiveness of this state, you know, I think there is an, there's just a fundamental need from so many of our um, business 
com of our companies that are located here to have a major presence in California, yeah. particularly in the Valley. I think the, the issue is how do we kind of not just keep them, but keep them kind of excited about being here, right? So it doesn't feel like they, well, they have to be here. And taxes is a piece of it. It's not the only part. No, I know it's not the only part. It's just yeah. it's just one thing that her and I discussed, and one of them is housing, of course. Yeah. Um, but um, but I think uh, is anybody uh, talking about like the new subcontracting laws, AB five, or or anything um, along the the, yeah. the concerns with with Prop thirteen changes? We're following the AB five change closely. We haven't heard kind of um, feedback in a formal way from are companies that, that would be kind of affected, um, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and, you know, the Prop 13 issue is we get a lot of questions about it, but we don't really have, uh, we haven't really analyzed, you know, its potential impact. So we're not really able to give a whole lot of guidance on it. Chris, what would you uh, add? Yeah, so um, th there's been one or two sort of direct feedbacks on the uh, uh, AB5 and the implementation around some sort of particular small businesses that have now had to take on those uh, drivers as employees. Um, and so uh, it's an adjustment to any business, I think. Um, I think the conversation around Prop 13 is, is difficult, and it's one that we'll be looking at in the year ahead. Um, the impact of a potential split role um, will have significant impacts on businesses in San Jose. I think what Especially we see- Especially small businesses, well, right? And, and so this is, yeah, the thing that we're really looking at. So from a, a, a large business perspective, the, the major sort of commercial footprints tend to turn over, at least on a five to 10 year basis. Um, but there's a lot of small businesses, especially where it's owner occupier, um, where they've been holding on to that space for a significant portion of time. And that is a significant tax bill uh, that will arrive as a part of that. So I think as we continue to explore issues around uh, small business displacement um, and you know small business resilience, uh, this is one of the issues we're really going to have to look at in the coming year. Yeah, I, I think it can, I, 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 well, I urge you to actually put it on your radar because if you're looking at small business displacement, this could be one of the big things that pushes businesses overboard or I guess into the grave. Um, so I'm hoping that you can you can put that on your radar and be, well, I don't know what you do to help, but um, but at least put it on your radar of things to, to be looking at of, of concern. Um, and as far as elements, you know, I know that they didn't have a grand opening. It's in my district, and it, it seemed that it was taking ungodly amounts of time to, to, to happen. Is, it, is everything okay with them? Or what, what, I think they're open, but what took them so long? You know, that's a really good question. I'm not aware of, of kind of any issues that they had. I can look into that, though, okay. and, and let right. your staff know. Okay. Uh, we'll go to uh, Pam Foley for, for her questions. Thank you, and. I'm going to start off with a disclaimer as a one of your uh, 15,800 small business <laughs> firms. Um, we have special inter special issues. I own co-own a mortgage company with my husband. I'm obviously not there very much right now, but I'm still the broker of record, so I have some little involvement. Um, but I I appreciate the effort and desire to keep making our small businesses, helping them to be successful. Because while Googles and Ebays and others are driving uh, development right. and driving uh, large employment numbers into the city of San Jose, it's the rest of us who are the stable block, who are employing the, maybe not the engineers, but the service workers or the uh, financial assistants who can help also drive our economy. So I want to actually direct my questions to um, Des regarding small business. And and uh, my company's been around for over 60 years. It's a law, it's a family business, small, six employees. And, and we survived a really dark times uh, 10 years ago when many of fellow mortgage companies were falling apart. We survived the, what, what, we, what we refer to as the dark years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did so because we're small and flexible and we're able to adjust. But there are outside pressures that affect small businesses. And in my particular business, it has to do with federal and state legislation, mm -hmm. which you have nothing to do with as it relates to mortgage mortgages. Um, AB5 slightly affects us, Prop 13 affects us, but not because we own, not because small businesses own the real estate that they're in, 
But because if split roles occurs and people don't understand this, they think if you're a renter mm -hmm. that you're not going to be affected by split roles. Here's how you will be affected. When your landlord, the owner of that building, gets their split role taxes increased, guess who they're going to pass that on to? They're going to pass it on to the business who occupies the space. Mm -hmm. You may have a lease that currently allows you to not, you, the, where you're not paying into the property taxes, but when you renegotiate, they're absolutely going to the, consider that. So that's going to affect small businesses and their sm who have very small margins from being able to employ the six people that we employ and pay them the full benefits that we pay them mm -hmm. because it will affect us. I'm not speaking for or against split roles right now, don't right. get me wrong. What I am attempting to do is educate folks on why it's an issue for a small business owner who is a renter and not just a property owner. Um, something in uh, the uh, packet that we got emailed to us was really of interest to me um, because uh, small business owners, they can't necessarily pay the top dollar for their staff. So they have to attract small business, they have to track people some ways. And we're having a hard time, we have a position, we're expanding our business, we're hiring one more person. We're having a really hard time finding someone qualified. I read in your packet that you assist somehow in finding staffing. Tell me how that works. Yeah, so the Work to Future program is designed to help connect job, job seekers with employers who are looking for people who, to work for them. Uh, and a big portion of what they do is, you know, in making that linkage, they have a variety of programs that are of assistance. One of them, which may be useful for you to consider, is the on-the-job training program, which basically allows you to hire someone uh, from the program and then identify the way that you want to train them, train them the way that you have in mind, and we will pay for a portion of their salary during that training period. And so the nice thing about that is it allows you to take a chance on someone who may not immediately match your, your needs and expectations, but using a three to six month period, you may be able to actually bring them up to the, the level of, uh, of assistance that you need, even if they don't have all the direct skills immediately coming in to work for you. So that's just one of the ways that we're trying to help support both small businesses as well as the local workforce, which may or may not have the skill set, particularly as we have a lot of people who are having to make transitions from positions that they had held to new positions as, as say, for instance, the retail industry continues to be in flux or, and evolve. So if an employer wanted to do that, how do they get uh, how do they become aware of that program? Who do they contact? Sure. The Work to Future program is, uh, shall I give you the phone number? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. That would be uh, 408. But, but I should include it in my newsletter, too. Okay. Uh, this great. is not just self-serving for phone. All right. Good enough. So maybe what we could do is follow up with some additional that information would be great. that would be useful that, in terms of that. That thing. would be great. Yeah. I don't need you to just give it to me. But, but, but I think it's a great tool because yeah. we're looking, you know, lots of small businesses, that's our struggle. Right. We don't have huge HR departments. Right. We're, not, uh, we're not the number one places where people are looking, but right. we want, uh, you know, just as qualified as employees and we want people who are going to stay around. And yeah. this is a company, my personal company, who just lost two people who have been with me for oh, over sorry. 25 years. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's yeah. tough to make these kind of replacements right. with a new workforce. So then, I'll go just go to work for work to future and figure it out from there. Yeah, well we'll, we'll follow up with you okay. to provide you with some additional stuff so you can distribute in your work. The other the other thing that you had mentioned was the concern about small business resiliency yeah. and that's an area that we are very concerned about as well because as you say the expertise that you have is in the real estate market but that doesn't necessarily carry over into other areas. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is provide small businesses with the tools that they need to be able to weather things. If they don't anticipate it because it's not within their uh, set of skills, that's a real problem because they can lose their lease or if they're in a triple net situation and the taxes go up, that affects them directly, even though they thought, oh, hey, I'm all set. That's a, you know, could be a concern for them. So we're trying to work on a series of workshops and we'll be continuing to do that through the, the coming year. Wonderful. If, if you want to pick a small business owner's brain, I'm happy to sit down with Great. you about Thank that. Great. Thank you. Very generous. I really appreciate the report. And uh, again, not to say our large businesses are not important. They're very critical. But 
most of the people I know work for small businesses and be, and they do so because they can tr control their own destiny that way. Mm -hmm. And it's a much more powerful position for them to be in as a small business owner. So I'm glad to see we're focused on all fronts to keep our businesses strong and in San Jose. Councilmember Perales. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, thank you, Pam, as well. I appreciate having a, a diversity of perspectives on the council, and so it's nice to have uh, individuals, um, you know, that, that can share those as well for, for those of us that aren't small business owners <laughs> that are able to, you know, to kind of benefit from the from the dialogue. So I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, I had a couple make comments maybe really. Uh, this was in regards to the, the, the section of companies struggling with city permitting uh, timeliness. And so my, my office has had through the years, uh, a number of small businesses reach out to us, and I know that the majority of them don't reach out to us, mm -hmm. um, but we've had a number of them that have, the most recent, which happened to make it into the report, was the Hapa Masubi. And, uh, and that was their frustration as they reached out to my office, was in regards to the, the permitting. And in fact, uh, they really appreciated, I think they were working with Juan, uh, and, and they really appreciated the Small Business Ally Program. Uh, they felt a lot of support in that regard. Um, where they ran into issues was, and we've heard this before, having uh, multiple inspectors with their own individual uh, perspectives on what you know was permitted or, or permissible or not, and um, and that caused a lot of delay, obviously a lot of headache, and even sort of an undoing, redoing of, of things that just because of of having again different inspectors coming out with different perspectives, and uh, and so we ended up able to, to to jump in and get involved and with the support uh, of John, uh, we're able to, to, to sort of iron this out, but in, in, right, in our thinking was, well, it shouldn't have taken that, right? And, and, and how do we, right, we already have issues we know with timeliness in this regard because of just staffing in general uh, or a lack of staffing. But then if we have conflicting staff interpretations mm. uh, and, and, and a multitude of staff members going out on something, uh, I, I can understand, right, from a small business perspective, why that would just be extremely frustrating. Because you're gonna, you want to take for, you know, at face value what a city staff member is saying, especially an inspector, and and move forward and make changes or whatever it is you need to do. But if you're getting conflicting viewpoints um, on different inspections and they're not there at the same time, and you're, it, you sort of are stuck with going, well, I had to listen to what the last one said and do that, and now I have to listen to what the next one says because I'm, I, how else do I, you know, cure that? And so, uh, like I said, and sometimes um, they'll reach out to my office. Unfortunately, we're, we're, we're able to help, uh, but it shouldn't take that, right? And, and we shouldn't have that level of, of frustration. And for a small business like that, that right, paying one month of rent without being able to open, right, it, it's it's a, a huge impact. And so, and we already know this, but I just think that that's something that um, I would hope that we can uh, begin to determine how, how we might be able to cure that, right? And, and whether it's one solid inspector or at least some you know, level of agreement or a way to communicate um, between the, the different inspectors so that, that we were on the same playing field. Uh, I wanted to mention just I'm excited about the Cloud Kitchens here downtown uh, and the old Hank Coca's. I, I think that was, and, and as was mentioned in there, the, t the section that was under the creativity we need to, cr you know, to bring in with some of these new uses. Um, and so I, I appreciate that and, um, and, and thank the team uh, for their work on that. Um, I just wanted to remind as well on the, the uh, Business impact um, fund that through VTA, uh, as we've, we've asked, this was in the small business an, uh, anti-displacement pilot. Um, I know that my team had asked in a memo that, that that does come back to this committee as well. So just putting a plug there, just making sure that that's coming back to CED. Um, and then uh, on the layoffs, the outplacement, I know that we, we talked a little bit about sort of what we're seeing, some trends. I'm curious if um, we are also looking at those trends in regards to, and I, and I imagine we are, but in regards to symptoms for a recession or for the next recession, right? Are we also are we looking at that to, 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 to see what we can do to prevent it? Um, but are we also looking at it, well, it's not just because of cost of housing uh, or some of the other factors, right, that we, that we know are more common, but is it also because it's, is this an indication, right, of, the recession coming, and, and we're all sort of been talking about that, although unfortunately we've been talking about it for like five years, <laughs> so it hasn't come around the corner, but is that also something that we are, we're looking at it uh, for that trend as well? We 
we are. So we get, um, when there's a mass layoff event in the city, the city and the mayor's office are notified through the Warren Act. And we, um, that's for any layoff that um, affects 50 or more people or a facilities closure. And uh, when we get those, we, and um, a lot of times in coordination with the mayor's office, try to do like an exit interview to understand mm -hmm. why there's a layoff event or a facilities closure. You can probably understand that a lot of times companies don't want to talk to us, um, but sometimes they do, and kind of drill down into what's causing this, and then we kind of, you know, think about what's, what is this a symptom of, or is it idiosyncratic to that, that business? Chris, would you add anything to what, kind of what we're seeing? Yeah, and I think, Council Member, to your point, we sort of try to keep an eye on where those industries are and, and sort of strategically think through where those layoffs are, because I think uh, as we look forward to the, you know, likely recession at some point, you know, we'll, we'll keep planning for it. Um, you know, what we're seeing or, or what we believe will happen is that the impact of that recession will not be distributed evenly. Right, that those in uh, lower skill, lower income jobs are probably going to suffer more given the costs around uh, this region. Um, so we're, we're sort of very cognizant of that and looking at those industries where there are opportunities for, you know, good career pathways and middle income jobs to ensure that we're not losing ground in the, the midterm, which is why you always hear us talk about our manufacturing and some of those other key industries that provide those opportunities because without those, we'll see some, you know, significant impacts on local populace. Great, uh, and in regards to that manufacturing, uh, I was excited to tour myself, and I guess I won't call it manufacturing, I'll call it distilling, um, but <laughs> the 10th Street Distillery, uh, yeah. I encourage my colleagues to just take a nice business tour of it. Um, <laughs> and cool. uh, I do have a nice sealed bottle in my in my office uh, that anybody can come look at. Uh, I'm not offering taste sam samples yet. But um, but it is, uh, it was exciting, right, to see that and, and, and other manufacturing, right, continuing to, to do well in San Jose. So I, I appreciate that and the work that we've put in regards to that. Um, I didn't see, I was, I was wondering what other businesses had benefited. Um, and, and so in the storefronts grants, I'm looking here and I, I didn't see too many, right, and I noticed that we've, um, we've done nine grants, 100,000 of the 250, and then it looks like we'll, we'll get up to maybe another 100,000. Uh, with the grants are working on. So does that mean that we won't hit the 250,000 that's allocated or? So, well, so Sal Alvarez is here who manages that program. Sal, do you want to just address kind of how we're tracking? Spend the other 50,000, Sal. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time when we started compiling the information, uh, we've had a, a sort of a ramp up. So right now we're about $215,000 oh, wow. um, like identified and qualified applicants. Perfect. And we still have, so, uh, uh, so just, big effort we're going to be trying to push for is outdoor seating on Santa Clara Street between like 2nd and 8th yeah. Street. Um, so there's a, a lot of interest from the property owners, business owners to get more vibrant activity out on that particular section of Santa Clara Street and we're hopefully going to get that chunk of money identified for those businesses. We're already engaging those folks. My, right. I have an intern from Santa Cruz University, um, Julian Cabrera, who's an accounting uh, student, um, already committed to Deloitte, who's been doing amazing work trying to keep track of that program and getting um, you know, direct communication in, in the outreach. It's Do you mind rattling off a couple of the other small businesses besides what we have listed in the report? Uh, um, so I could provide that to you. Okay. You don't have them off the top of your head. Uh, I mean, I could kind of, yes, yeah, so I'd rather just provide that to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you could, uh, and then my colleagues, or maybe you, you can copy us. I'm just interested because we, we we'll didn't see too much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it's always nice to see which businesses were able yeah. to, to yeah. benefit from this program something that I have uh, been excited to support year over year, and I know that my colleagues through the budget process, right, have uh, had a, an interest as well with the business uh, growth and opportunities throughout the, the rest of the city. Uh, and so that's, I just like looking at what businesses are able to, to benefit, and we, we are constantly encouraging uh, new businesses or even old businesses that have the opportunity to, to benefit mm -hmm. from this. Um, and so uh, I appreciate that it looks like we'll be on track then to, to use all of those funds. Last thing on the last uh, page you have uh, in the year ahead, just the uh, priorities. I, I don't know if it falls under retail support, but I didn't see the small business ally. I just was kind of oh. curious if that is um, as a priority and does that fit under this retail support or is it something else? So I'm just curious based on the list here, I didn't see it. 
Yeah, so the, the small business ally is obviously a critical part of our operation. That's sort of an ongoing program. I think as we're looking at the retail support, we're really thinking through that new position uh, that we're hopefully going to hire for very soon. Uh, we're into the process now. Okay, so uh, that would be candidates. kind of an additional person. At with, right, exactly. With that. So right. we have the two business allies that are on staff from PBC um, that are sort of constantly delivering that service. Um, this is as part of the uh, last year's budget process. Right? It added um, two-year funding for a position that just focuses citywide exclusively on retail development. Okay, great. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Council Member Esparza. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the great report. And um, I actually wanted to, when I was looking through the report on page um, Three, um, it was talking about small businesses in the city. They can't all stay. Some of it had to relate to space options. I wanted to raise the issue of quality of life issues that impact businesses in San Jose. So as one of the city's industrial areas, um, I have a number of businesses that are threatening to leave San Jose because of quality of life issues. Um, I have a $50 million business, a year business that we're working really hard to keep, another um, $70 million a year business that I'm working really hard to keep. They want to stay here. It's just those quality of life issues. They're worried about cleanliness, the safety of their employees, um, and, um, and their ability really to the image that they're projecting when they're trying to have business meetings with other folks. And so, um, one, I wanted to make a comment, and two, I wanted to bring up how are you working with those issues so that you can make the connections for the city between, for example, the um, on Union Pacific, the over 800,000 pounds of garbage, most of which came from illegal dumping that was picked up off Monterey first. Um, are we making those connections as a city between that and our ability to have businesses stay and come to San Jose? Yeah, that's a huge issue, and especially in our industrial areas. Um, we do engage on those um, kind of quality of life issues, and really what we try to do is just um, make sure those companies are armed with the information about how you know they can kind of report and access city services. Um, and then also we try to liaise with the city departments as well. Um, to be, I mean, it's a ne kind of a never-ending struggle in some of these areas, mm -hmm. um, and so part of it also is education um, as well, kind of helping companies understand what are the resources available and kind of if there's a wait, why, why that's a wait, um, which is really, really um, hard, but um, I think, you know, we've, we've done a lot to try to help companies understand where, where the city's at, um, but it's a constant education process. And as the city moves forward on some of these issues, taking a multi-departmental approach, is OED at the table at some of these meetings? Yeah, I mean, yes. I think you've you've seen the city manager's office, mm -hmm. and and OED is part of the city manager's office, play um, a much stronger role in coordinating and aligning the various departments because it's really a shared responsibility. So we're often in a position to connect the dots mm -hmm. about w why this is so important and what we should be doing and then having good communication with the business community and the property owners because it's important that they, as you mm -hmm. know, have confidence in the city that we're, we're hearing and then we're acting on the information. Sure, yeah, and we're working so hard to bring businesses to yeah. San Jose. It seems like a low-hanging fruit would be to keep the ones we have, right? Um, so I just wanted to raise that um, that issue and that we need more increased coordination. Um, and also, again, on um, I'll just add one more thing, which is looking at um, some of the types of businesses. So um, I, I'm thinking of a business in my in my district, not on the Monterey corridor, but in another industrial section of, of my district, um, they act, their business actually brought a lot of blight and issues <laughs> in the community. They left um, and things were kind of calm and the other businesses in the area were kind of good. And then we got another one of the same type of businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of ironic. I've actually been contacted by the owners of that business um, who you know, because we're trying to work on some of the issues, the blight that they're bringing in. <laughs> so it's, um, so, you know, maybe we can look at 
um, bringing in um, additional or newer types of businesses and not just doing like cookie cutter, like that was what was there, maybe we have a chance to bring in 2.0. So I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I uh, had a question on the page for the investor and developer outreach. Um, I wanted to ask, um, this is about the investment in development sites. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that and what parts of the city you were actually kind of trying to, to bring those resources mm -hmm. to? Yeah, so um, this past year, there was a real burst of interest in, in kind of investing in San Jose. We saw from um, hotel developers, industrial developers, office developers who you know are kind of taking a look at San Jose in a fresh way. They were across the spectrum. And so um, in terms of hotels, uh, hospitality, there's been such an appetite for new hotels, we had folks looking, you know, everywhere, not just downtown in North San Jose, but, you know, on the west side, um, you know, uh, the new hotel project on Monterey Road, right, the expansion. So um, that was, I was kind of surprised at that, you know, that it was kind of across the board. Um, on the industrial front, kind of warehouse, distribution, manufacturing, um, the trend has been um, developers and investors looking to kind of get as close to the population as possible. Um, which was new. Um, traditionally, those folks have been kind of focused on the city's outskirts. Um, and then uh, in terms of where we saw geographical focus, um, people were very interested in downtown um, in kind of central San Jose, um, kind of the, the down, what I would call downtown sort of sphere of influence. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, where we're pitching, I mean, we, we pitch the entire city and um, kind of, especially when we're looking at a specific type of investor, you know, we're, we're aware of where, you know, an opportunity may be for that specific kind of um, in, uh, investment. Okay, thank you. Um, and on the um, storefronts grants program, um, I had similar questions about that. When you send us the information, can you also tell us what type of business it is and where it is in the city? Um, I'm interested in kind of that, um, you know, where all this is happening and is there one type of business that's more attracted to getting this program than others? Because I actually think this is a program that should grow. Um, if anything, it's not big enough. So. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I just had one more comment, really, which is I wanted to thank you. Um, the Monterey Corridor work is in here. That was me being subtle earlier, saying Monterey, <laughs> yes, we're pushing South San Jose. Um, Very good. <laughs> and so I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, I think we have a long ways to go, but um, it really is a jewel in the city. and. Um, and we really need to attract sort of that next level of development, mm -hmm. the advanced tech manufacturing and other industries that um, need more support. For thank sure. you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll move approval of a staff report. Second. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. And um, I appreciate all the, uh, the work and I know you have a busy year ahead of you too. So thank you for your time and uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Oh, anybody opposed? Okay, I didn't hear any. All right, on to our next item, uh, contracting with local and small businesses in, in fiscal year 2018-2019. All right, good afternoon. Sorry about the side chatter here. Uh, Apologize. No problem, no problem. Mm -hmm. So my name is David French. I am a division manager with the Department of Public Works. I'm joined by Jennifer Chang, who is a deputy director of finance. And we are here to report out on the citywide contracting with local and small businesses for fiscal year 2018-19. And with that, I will pass it on to Jennifer Chang. Great, thanks, David. 
So just to give a little bit of recap of what finance purchasing is responsible for, um, we are responsible for the procurement and contracting of equipment, goods, and non-consulting services for the city. So some examples include fire trucks, you know, maintenance repair services, landscaping, fuel, software, IT, IT systems, and things of that nature. Last year, in fiscal year 1819, we spent approximately $259 million on these types of goods and services, where a local business award is estimated to be about 33% of total spend, and small business award estimated to be about 7% of total spend. In addition, about $14 million was spent using the city's procurement cards, also known as P cards. P cards are designed to facilitate small dollar purchase transactions, and we estimate about 28% of total P card transactions last year was awarded to local businesses. If you look at the bottom half of the slide, we have listed a, a total of six local small and minority business outreach events that finance staff had attended in 2019. So at these events, staff provided vendors information and answered their questions on how they can do business with the city. We updated our doing business with the city vendor guide to reflect updated resources and instruction, instructions for registering on our new e-procurement portal, which was launched in 2019. This slide here shows the trend in purchase order and contract spend by overall dollars and by local and small business spend. As you can see in the last fiscal year, 1819, overall spend at $259 million increased over $58 million over prior year. Based on current methodology and available data, we estimate local spend in FY 1819 comprised about $86 million and of the local business spend, about half or $18 million was with, was with local, uh, with, was with small businesses, excuse me. And in this slide here, uh, it shows the trend in purchase order and contract spend um, by count, and the number of purchase orders and agreements increased by 5% over prior year in fiscal 1819. And similarly, we've seen trends updated, uh, updated trends in estimated local and small business award. Okay. So on to public works procurement. So public works is responsible for procuring construction contractors, and we also oversee the, con the procurements for um, design and engineering consultant services as well. Um, before I get into this, um, you're going to hear me use a few terms. Uh, you're going to hear me use major construction contract, minor construction contract, as it pertains to this report, a, a minor construction contract is um, construction contracts that are under $100,000. There were some uh, charter code changes and municipal, municipal code updates last year that increased to $600,000. However, for this reporting cycle, it is at that $100,000 threshold. So in total, uh, we awarded $191 million in construction contracts of which 27% of those total dollars awarded were to local businesses and 6% were to small businesses. You will see that um, as I get into the number of contracts awarded, we, de we did see a decrease in that number, which I'll talk about in here in just a second. But overall, for the, the percentage of dollars awarded, we remain fairly consistent for the five-year period. Um, for our consultant con contract awards, uh, we awarded $35 million in, in consultant contracts. Um, local business received 60% of those dollars, while small businesses received 46%, and that was a, a significant increase from the pi, uh, five, past five fiscal years. Excuse me. So the chart here reflects the construction contracts awards, which I just uh, mentioned a second ago. Um, so we awarded 57 total construction contracts last fiscal year. 23% of those contracts were awarded to local businesses and 9% were, were awarded to small businesses. Um, you can see, as I mentioned, that is a de decrease from the, the, f the past five fiscal years. However, we feel with the program that we have in place, which I'll discuss here in just a second, that can really help um, increase those numbers um, back up. For our consultant contracts awards, we awarded 26 contracts of which 69% were awarded to local and 42% were awarded to small, which again was a significant increase from the, the past fiscal year. Um, we feel that our consultant, consultant contracts are, are very healthy with our local and small business participation. Um, a lot of that is due to we, have, we do have a lot of local 
um, engineering and, and architectural design consultants in the area. Um, also, too, a lot of the larger companies also have a, a satellite office in, within Santa Clara County, too, as well, which by definition would make them a local business. So as I mentioned, our construction contracts did decrease last year, and we feel that um, our, our contracting, our public works contracting program is a great opportunity for us to increase that participation. Um, our public works contracting program is made up of a, a few different areas. One is the, the Public Works Contracting Academy. Um, I know uh, Council has heard a lot about the Academy, um, and we continue to, to run that play. And, uh, we do have, uh, what that academy is made up by opportunity awareness events, which are events we get out in the community centers, invite contractors and consultants to those events, and talk about the upcoming contracting opportunities that the city has, as well as how to, how to find out about those opportunities utilizing our e-procurement platform. It also gives them an opportunity to get face-to-face -face with city staff and, um, and our engineers and our, our individuals leading those groups of engineers too as well. We also host construction contracting seminars. So these seminars are, um, are built to educate contractors on how to manage a public works contract from bidding all the way through project completion. Um, and that feeds into our minor pre-qualification program, um, which I'll talk about here in just a second. But we feel that this, the seminars give uh, valuable information um, to contractors on how to manage these types of contracts so it makes them feel comfortable participating in, in public works contracting. Um, we also, as a part of the, the Contracting Academy, have continuing education workshops. So these are, are, are really um, focused workshops from our seminars. Uh, we, uh, we survey all of the participants of the, the, the um, contracting seminars, and we really focus on, on something that they want to focus on. So we listen to them, and if they want additional information, we will follow that up with an educational workshop specifically designed for that. Um, another uh, program that we implemented was a minor public works project pre-qualification program. Um, what this is, is we establish pools of contractors that we then will solicit minor contracts to, um, which really uh, makes it more competitive for our minor, our minor contracting. Minor contracts are, um, the way we bid those out is an informal process, and so um, we don't have to put it on our e-procurement platform. We actually can, can bid it specifically to the pool of contractors. And we feel the more local and small contractors we can get involved in that pre-qualification program, the more opportunities it will, have, it will give them to win, uh, bid and, uh, and be awarded public works contracts. Uh, we currently have five established pools for our public or pre-qualification pools. Um, and within those pools, we have uh, roughly approximately 26 contractors who have been pre-qualified for various scopes of work. And of those 26, um, we have 59% of them who are local and 37% of those are also small. Local and, and small business preference on minor construction contracts was one of the um, municipal code changes. So on our minor contracts, we now give a 2.5% um, credit if they are local and 2.5% credit if they are small. So they could potentially get up to a 5% credit when we evaluate their bids. Um, just for math purposes, if someone gives us a $100 bid um, and they are local and small, when we evaluate the bid, we'll evaluate that as $95. And if a non-local um, or small participant has $98, the $95 bid will be awarded. And when we do award, it will be for the full $100 amount. So. All right, so we just wanted to share with you guys a few projects that were completed by local small contractors. So we did have um, plant instrument error system upgrade at our regional wastewater facility um, that was completed by a local and small contractor, Anderson Pacific, which, um, which is really good to see at our regional wastewater facility because typically those are larger projects and we don't see a lot of small local participation on those. So it was a great project um, for them to work on. Uh, gum drop and partridge drive main replacement was completed by a local contractor, Pacific Underground. And then Happy Hollow Zoo and per, um, perimeter fencing was completed by a local contractor as well as the airport terminal B south ramp reconstruction phase one project. So that concludes our presentation. We will open it up for questions. All right, council member Foley. I just have a couple clarif clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. When you refer to, and thank you for your report, I really appreciate your focus on local and small businesses. It's important to hear how we're getting, uh, we're able to put them to work, doing work in our city. 
Um, minor, you mentioned pi minor public works. What qualifies in a minor category? What dollar, I'm sure that's dollar amount driven. What is that? That is dollar amount driven. And so um, for this reporting cycle, as I mentioned, that's $100,000 or below. Oh, However, okay. yeah, starting October of last year, that increased to $600,000. So now it's $600,000 and below are minor contracts. Okay, good. Um, and the report that shows local uh, construction contracts dropping from 32% in 1718 to 1819% in 23%, what attributed to that decrease? Do you have an idea? So, I mean, we have some ideas. Um, there's a lot that goes into a low bid scenario. Um, it could be from, um, you know, the market is hot right now and construction, you know, the, the prices are up um, for construction across the board. So it could be a, a participation thing. And that's something that we're actually looking at tracking in the future is um, participation, not okay. only as a, as a prime contractor, but also as a subcontractor for local and small businesses, which we'll rep be reporting out on the, the, the upcoming reports. Um, but really, there's just so many different factors that go into a low bid that it's really hard for us to pinpoint exactly exactly why that de decrease was. And we're bound by accepting the low bid. We give a 25 and 25 half percent credit which can help, but maybe doesn't. Correct. Right? Now, um, I, and I didn't preference this, these oh, numbers not, that you're looking at yeah. are for major construction Right, I was contracts. just going to, yeah. Right, and so the yeah, preference would right. apply. Yeah, yeah. I, I know I said that and then realized my mistake. Okay. So uh, th uh, that ac actually answered my next question, which was what size projects, and these are major projects you're talking about. Correct. Okay. All right, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Com Councilmember Esparza? Yeah, I just... Well, wanted to say this is great work. Um, it was very cool to see 59% um, are local businesses and 37% are local and small. Um, this is such an important program and can really help um, our local businesses grow to that next level. So thank you. Okay, I'll Councilman move. Corrales. That's okay. You can do it. You can move it. Uh, I'll move it. Uh, Second. Second. Yeah, I'll move it. Oh. Public uh, comment. Oh, I apologize. Yes, yeah, go for it. Yes, go let me, for it. Let me do public comment first. Sorry, Mason. Thank you. Uh, Mason Fong, Director of Public Policy Communications at the SVO. First of all, great presentation by staff. They also presented to the Vice Mayor Jones Small Business Advisory Task Force. Um, three points. Uh, with the attachment that I think uh, the chair has, uh, or if he's circulating, uh, there's two documents. The first document, I just pulled up a random bid from uh, last year's agenda. And when this is presented to the public, the contract and bid comparative analysis is not included. I have heard that uh, staff has that online at Bedingo, so that's great, so that public works contractors who don't get the bid can see why they didn't get the bid. Uh, but it'd be great if that was publicized. And on the second document you'll see is my own Sunnyvale City Council agenda, where we have uh, the pu public bids comparisons for every bid. Um, and so it, it just allows uh, both council and the members of the public to see this is why their bid is higher. It, their mm. pipe valve number two is uh, quoted at X rate versus Y rate that was actually awarded. Um, and so why, how this helps is that staff pointed out it's very difficult to pinpoint why a, a lowest bid does not go f through for a small bid. But staff might be able to study it, if it's council priority or anything like that why that is and how we can better do outreach through the Public Works Academy, through the minor bid pre-qualification process and things like that. So for example, if I'm a, a small business that wasn't awarded the contract, then I can say, oh, is it because that person has a subcontractor that's at a different rate that's lower, I should go talk to that subcontractor. So that allows small businesses the authority and the ability to learn the process more. Um, and I only have 18 seconds, but I'd be happy to discuss this in more depth. Um, and so the last point is that uh, best value contracting still hasn't been implemented. It was passed in 2018 by the voters. And so the city's still operating on lowest bid. And so my question would just be, why is that? Thank you. Thank you. All good questions. Uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, I was actually just going to mention that on this slide, um, I think it's, you know, it's unfortunate that we've dipped so low, but it's fortunate that we, you know, hopefully have a policy that's uh, going to help change this trajectory as you state in your report. So looking forward to that, and uh, the motion was made. Thanks.
Thank you. And as far as best value contracting, what, when, when is that going to start? Is that the same time when we're going to 600000 um, no, well, 600000 was actually last October is when that went into effect. So best value contracting, we're actually finalizing documents and everything else now. Um, so we should, um, we are anticipated to have our first best value procurement here, um, I would say, before the end of the fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. All right. If there's no other questions, all in favor? Aye. All right. That passes. Thank you very much. Anybody from the public that wants to speak on open forum? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Meetings adjourned. Thank you very much for your time. Great.